one of the most enthralling events that is said to have occurred during this span of time is the passing of an ice age that makes every other ice age in history look like the inside of your freezer. Now, if you have been following along, this is part three in our series on the Proterozoic, which is part of a greater series on historical geology. Now, make sure to go back and watch parts one and two on the Proterozoic for context. You'll find the links in the description. Now, in this video, we're going to look at the Neo-Proterozoic era, which conventionally starts at about a billion years ago using the conventional dating system. And it ends about 540 million years ago with the onset of the Phanerozoic Eon. Now, perhaps one of the most enthralling events that is said to have occurred during this span of time is the passing of an ice age that makes every other ice age in history look like the inside of your freezer. Imagine our Earth completely covered in kilometer thick ice extending from one pole to the other and where even the world's oceans are covered over with hundreds of meters of solid ice. This otherworldly picture of our Earth has actually been hypothesized and most conventional scientists now believe that during the cryogenian period of the Neo-Proterozoic era, our entire planet was locked up in snow and ice several times, sometimes for tens of millions of years at a time, over a total period lasting about 140 million years, it will take 10 million years. Now, this hypothesis, enchantingly called Snowball Earth, has in the last three decades captured the imaginations of scientists, teachers, and students of all ages all over the world. Now, in this video and in the next, we'll briefly look at the Snowball Earth hypothesis and then discuss some caveats that I think render this hypothesis tenuous at best. Okay, so how do we get a planetary ball of ice in the first place? Now, one of the most important mechanisms involves the mass removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Uh, the result would produce the exact opposite of what happens during greenhouse conditions. The greenhouse effect occurs when molecules that we call greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide being one of the most common, keep the Earth's heat from leaking out into space. The overall effect will produce a warm planet. But take that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and you end up with an ice age. Now, there are literally dozens of potential mechanisms that scientists think were involved in this atmospheric drawdown of carbon dioxide, but some of the most promising are algal blooms produced by the iron dust blowing in from the continents, as well as high levels of erosion. As it turns out, both of these mechanisms can only work given the role of the world's oceans, which can act like a great big carbon sponge. Sediments, which contain lots of carbon, end up in the ocean, and oceanic bacterial and algal blooms likewise act to draw carbon dioxide from the atmosphere down into the oceans. Now, both of these processes can lock carbon away for long periods of time. Now, another important mechanism that has been proposed by scientists is the reduced solar radiation that apparently characterized Proterozoic time. It is estimated that the sun's radiation at that time was lower by about 6%. Now, altogether, and in conjunction with the low concentrations of atmospheric carbon dioxide, and paleoclimatologists believe that ice sheets spread from both poles outward into areas of low latitude near the equator, eventually plunging the world into several permanent frozen states, spanning, as I said, about 140 million years. And yes, for my critics who constantly like to berate me for leaving out this or that datum in 10 minute videos, other mechanisms have also been proposed, 
including cyclical variations in the shape of Earth's orbit, the angle its axis has taken in the past, ocean currents, plate movements, albedo feedbacks, among many others. Now, it is important to note that all of these hypotheses have generally been applied in various ways by different scientists with no real consensus on an explanation that is scientifically unified. Now, this paper, for example, states, despite the intensity of climate modeling devoted to understanding the glaciations of the Gryogenian, where in the effects of reduced solar luminosity, increased rotation rate, high planetary obliquity, different atmospheric CO2 concentrations, different paleogeographical and paleotopographical configurations, governed by plate tectonics, different ice albedo feedbacks, incorporation of ocean circulation and heat transport, and sea ice dynamics have all been investigated. There is no consistent explanation of cryogenian climate change. In other words, let's be very cautious about this hypothesis. So, how did the Earth escape from this monstrous snowy prison? Well, since the ocean was apparently covered over with kilometer thick ice, carbon escaping into the atmosphere from various volcanoes was apparently able to rapidly build up in the atmosphere, causing it, and thus the Earth, to get warm again. Now remember, the ocean acts as a sink sucking up all available carbon. But if it's locked up with ice, then it cannot perform that function. So scientists think that the atmosphere collected so much carbon so fast that the ice melted catastrophically in just a few thousand years. Now, this kind of catastrophic melting, given extended periods of ice cover over tens of millions of years, is actually quite interesting given similar kinds of catastrophic processes put forward by young age creationists. So what evidence is there to support the notion of snowball Earth? Well, one of the first pieces of evidence put forward by scientists as early as Louis Agassiz in the 19th century was the presence of sedimentary deposits called diamictites. Now, a diamictite is a sedimentary rock type that consists of very, very poorly sorted sediments ranging in size from clay to boulders that are suspended in a finer mudstone, siltstone, or sandstone. Essentially, these deposits look really chaotic and often contain rocks that are very angular, suggesting that they didn't get tumbled around too much in the process of being moved. Now, diamectites can form in a variety of ways, but are almost always associated with underwater sediment gravity flows. Now, sediment gravity flows, as the name suggests, occur when sedimentary rocks, sand, and mud move downhill under the influence of gravity. Now, some sediment gravity flows produce deposits that are fine-grained, but others produce chaotic diamictite deposits as well as a whole host of in-between deposits with all sorts of internal textures. Now, as it turns out, neoproterozoic diamictites can be found all over the world, but are interpreted by many scientists to be remobilized till from tillites. A tillite is a diamictite, but its matrix, or the sediment in between those larger rocks, it tends to have a flowery or pasty consistency that forms from ground up rock. So as a glacier moves over a rock surface, it plucks up rocks of all different sizes, some of which gets pulverized. Now all of this rocky debris gets left behind when the glacier melts. Now true tillites are good evidence supporting a past glacial climate. Now importantly, once the glacial till, that's the material coming from the bottom of the glacier, is moved into marine or lake environments where other sedimentary processes sort of take over, the resulting chaotic mass of rock, it can't be called a tillite, but must instead be given the more generic diamictite appellation. 
Now, since all of the neoproterozoic dimectites were deposited in marine settings, many scientists that favor the snowball earth hypothesis propose that the rocks and other debris that make up the dimectites came from floating ice. Remember, ice can pick up and carry large amounts of sediments and has been known to carry huge rocks as large as and even larger than houses. These sediment filled glaciers, they're said to have moved out into the shallow marine environments all over the world and dropped their sediment load as they melted. So although these diamictites cannot be called true tillites, snowballers still believe they were generated by glacial processes. Now, a few scientists have, however, challenged this assessment for proterozoic diamectites, favoring instead a sediment gravity flow interpretation. As it turns out, we can use diamectites that were deposited during the last ice age and where the glacial origin is virtually guaranteed. And we can compare them to those we find in the fossil record. The results, they're quite startling. As it turns out, Pleistocene diamectites from the last ice age were deposited on the ocean floor when large ice sheets moved out over the ocean and dumped out their glacially derived loads of till. Yet these diamectites have maximum thicknesses of about 100 meters, with most only reaching about 50 meters in thickness due to a lack of accommodation space under the ice sheet. This is a limiting factor that constrains glacially influenced diamectite thicknesses. Now, in contrast, almost all neoproterozoic diamectites are very, very thick, usually around a thousand meters. That's a kilometer thick, and sometimes as thick as several thousand meters. Now, this piece of evidence in and of itself strongly suggests that these neoproterozoic diamectites are the result of sediment gravity flows which can catastrophically dump kilometer thick successions of sediment to the marine realm quite easily. Okay, another piece of evidence that suggests a sediment gravity flow interpretation is the almost ubiquitous presence of turbidites that are interbedded with the diamectites. A turbidite is an undisputed underwater sediment gravity flow which leaves behind a distinctive depositional pattern that is easily identified. Now, when hundreds of these turbidites flow down a submarine that's underwater slope, they can accumulate one atop the other in very, very thick successions, sometimes thousands of meters thick. Yet these undisputed underwater gravity flows are found intercalated within the diamectites. Now, other evidence indicating a gravity flow origin for neoproterozoic diamectites is the presence of really, really big clasts of limestone, sometimes hundreds of meters in length, that also get incorporated into these thick overall sedimentary successions. These limestone clasts were almost certainly sourced from massive carbonate platforms that existed around the margins of ancient Rodinia and have aptly been called megabreches. Megabreches are deposits that are composed of really, really, really big angular clasts and are often associated with rapid and catastrophic underwater sediment gravity flows. Now, the presence of megabreches along with turbidites in conjunction with the very, very great thicknesses of diamectites makes it extremely unlikely that these diamectites have a glacial origin. One paper puts it like this. The very great thickness of debris flow and turbidite facies in the Neoproterozoic record points to enhanced delivery of very substantial volumes of sediment to basin margins. This is also completely at odds with the notion of global refrigeration and the assumed cessation of all hydrologic activity and sedimentary processes by the snowball model. Now, of course, someone might object, okay? And they might say, well, where did the origin of these kilometer thick sedimentary successions come from uh, since they're all over the world? If they don't have a glacial origin, then where did they come from? And the answer is actually quite simple. The breakup 
of the ancient continent of Rodinia, it correlates exactly with the supposed snowball Earth. Both processes began at about 750 million years ago using the conventional time scale, and both processes ceased at about 620 million years ago, give or take 10 million years. So all of the sediment naturally came from the breakup of this supercontinent. Of course, it is possible that there is simply a link between glaciation and the breakup of Rodinia. And in fact, some scientists have tried to tie both processes together using isostatic lift. So as mass shifts around on fracturing continents, parts of some of those continents are elevated into the snow line, causing the accumulation of snow. But other scientists have countered this suggestion, noting that this would only produce local glaciation, such as that which we see today. So why do many scientists continue to interpret neoproterozoic diamectites in terms of remobilized till? In other words, why do they think that the rocks and sediment in the diamectites came from glacially derived debris dropped into the ocean instead of from non-glacially derived sediment gravity flows? Well, it's because of other characteristics consistent with glacial environments. So although there are several, the four most persuasive are striated pavements, cap carbonates, banded iron formations, and drop stones. Now, we will discuss all these criteria in the next video, but before we finish up today, it's gonna to be important to put all of this into a biblical perspective, as well as sort of giving you a little exam to see how much you took in. Okay, biblically speaking, I believe the breakup of Rodinia and all associated sedimentary processes associated with that breakup, as well as everything that we've discussed so far in this historical geology series, took place within the creation week as it's described in Genesis 1. Go back to the video on the Hadean and Archean for more details and you'll find a link in the description. And I'll put a link in the description for some mature creationism videos that I did on this as well. Okay, and now let's test your comprehension. Now, if you don't want to get the answers right away, then make sure to pause the video right after I say the question, okay? All right, here's the first one. What is the name of the molecule discussed in this video that often contributes to the greenhouse effect? And the answer, carbon dioxide. What is the name of the supercontinent that apparently broke apart during the Neoproterozoic? And Rodinia is the answer you needed here. Okay, what is the name of the geologic period associated with the supposed onset of glaciation in the Proterozoic Eon? Thinking about that one? All right, if you said the cryogenian, you'd be correct. Good job. All right, what process supposedly added carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, essentially ending the Proterozoic Ice Age? If you said volcanism, then give yourself a pat on the back. Good job. All right, last one here, true or false? A bona fide tillite is almost always associated with glaciation. And the answer is true. Okay, so look out for part two, which is coming up soon. Um, but for now, that's the end of this video. Please go ahead, pound that like button. If you enjoyed this video, if you got anything out of it at all, please go ahead and subscribe. And look, share this on your social media platform. I would really appreciate it. Go ahead and press that share button. Of course, there's a link in the description if you'd like to give. And as always, I appreciate prayer and we'll see you next time. Thank you and goodbye.